because this is where the chair is and the, it's e it'll be easier to direct the flow of the meeting. Where the action is. Where the action is, that's right. But it's, it's, it's too early in the week to spend all your working group meeting time doing email, so just participate. All right, we are at the top of the hour. We'll start in 60 seconds. This side of the room. Yeah. It's, what's awkward is the obstructed view with the pillar. You know. Yeah. It's like the old Boston Garden. Might be good to move the mic a little closer to you, Rich. It's yeah, it, I know. It doesn't pick up all that well. Okay, is that better now? Oh, it's much better when you move when you lean in. All right, I will uh, speak. Speak closer to the mic. A, a suggestion, folks. You may want to sit on this side of the room, but. If you want to be, you know, if you got email to do or whatever, feel free. I'm just suggesting, not, a re not requesting, I don't care where you sit, particularly. <clears throat> All right, so. Welcome to the second session of, IE, of the 118th IETF. This is the HTTP API working group. If this is not the flight you were expected to be on, please notify your, you know, the gate's right there, get out quickly. All right. All right I'm just gonna stop suggesting people move over. Okay, uh, welcome. My name is Rich. Uh, Daryl Remote is our is co chair. Mark Nottingham in the front corner here is our secretary. Uh, this session is being recorded, and uh, we might as well get started. Uh, the note well. So <clears throat> you will have see you will see this more times than you can count probably by the end of the week. This document, which is really an eye chart, describes you know, IETF policies and procedures uh, for participation. Uh, don't try to have any hidden patents, be uh, responsible for all of these other, you know, behave nice, be respectful, be professional. Um, document, copy, documents submitted to the IETF and adopted uh, are copyright by the IETF. And uh, as a, as, again, uh, just, you know, be a responsible, mature person, you won't have a problem, which means I have problems. Uh, no, really well. Um, the meetings, you know, again, there's reference to the Code of Conduct, which is an RFC, 7154. No, I don't have that number memorized. Um, we try to maintain an environment that's inclusive, professional, um, and accepts people from all sorts of different backgrounds. Uh, do not harass anybody else. You know, we keep the content and the discussion technical. Uh, you can say, you know, this idea that you proposed is not a very good one. Um, don't say, uh, don't say the second sentence, which is, you know, this idea is stupid and your mother dresses you funny, right? Don't, don't, don't say that kind of thing. I'm not, I don't mean to be flip, I'm just, Try to lighten the mood a bit. Uh, meeting tips in person. Um, we do try to accommodate as best as we can uh, in this hybrid meeting situation, which is what it's going to be all the time. Um, you know, there is an on site tool. We'll pass around the blue sheet if you haven't. Uh, sure. Code there. Sorry. 
the QR code on that sheet uh, will get you to the lightweight browser-based client. And that's how we do a sign-in list. That's also how we manage the queue for people who want to speak. Um, as the chair, I'll see the queue, uh, recognize you. You can stand at the mic if you want, but don't start speaking. When you speak, identify, you know, name, say your name, affiliation, and so on, so people know who you are. And for the note takers, Resources, kind of a little late, but if you haven't already seen the meeting agenda, there's some links on how to do it, information on MeetEcho. Uh, if you have any problems, technical assistance, just email support at ietf.org. All right. You want to start, Daryl? Sure. Take, um, take over? Uh, first piece of administrivia here is uh, we need a note taker. Somebody who will volunteer to uh, record all the wondrous conversations we're about to have. Doesn't need to be in great depth. Rich, you're going to have to watch for hands because I can only see a small slice of the room. As I'm sure there's many people who put in volunteering. Oh, look at that scanning. We can't proceed without a minute taker. I can do it if necessary. You only have to record. And if you go to the agenda, there's a link that says point to the Etherpad hedge doc. Sorry, Cody MD hedge doc, Etherpad, whatever. Uh, shared comment. The, the agenda is already in there. So you just have to record the occasional sentence of when we come to a conclusion. Any volunteers? All right. Uh, in the interest of, I can help. Okay, okay, great. Okay, so Mark, Mark, Mark. Between Mark and I, we'll get it done. And Excellent. Thank you. thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mark. And if uh, there are conversations that come up on uh, Zulip or in the chat, uh, please feel free to also add into the, the notes any things that get missed there. Uh, Francesca, welcome back. Uh, we also are going through a little bit of a reorganization with regards to the areas. The important thing for us, if I understand correctly, it doesn't affect us. We have the same chairs. We have the same area director. We just get a new name. And I believe that name is Wit. Is that correct? I don't well, know what I it stands you, for. You'd have to talk. Stand up in front of the room. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, yes, that is correct. With uh, web and internet transport. And I've had a, a short um, presentation in dispatch about it. So I, I wouldn't want to repeat, but. Yes, HTTP API is going to WIT, and I'm staying the responsible AD. Awesome, thank you. My apologies, 3 a.m. was a little early for dispatch for me. I'll have to catch up later. Uh, excellent, okay, so um, the agenda as we have it today, uh, we are going to do a brief update on documents that have changed status in the overall processing. So that will include a uh, short description on YAML media types, link template, header fields, and problem details. And then we have a presentation on API catalog, and we are going to have some discussions around uh, the other documents that have had activity around them, or in some cases, no activity around them. Uh, and there's a list of those fields there. We have an open conversation on uh, adoption of a relative JSON pointer. And uh, we have a arbitrary deadline that we set for making a decision on the deprecation spec. Uh, before we proceed into the first step, would anybody like to do any agenda bashing? Okay, no signs in the room. Okay, and 
hopefully uh, that uh, the slide this 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 time actually fit onto the screen. It was somewhat challenging last time with a rather large list of things to do. Okay, so when it comes to uh, documents that have changed status, we have um, the YAML media type that is in the RFC editor queue. Uh, it has ha gone through all of the IANA processing, the IANA expert review. It is actually a media type that is now registered in the IANA registry. Uh, it is sitting in the queue saying, waiting for IESG. Um, upon doing some research, I'm not exactly sure what it is waiting from the ISG for. So uh, I think, Rich, you and I will need to go and poke around a little bit and you can explain to me some of the additional processes as to what it might be waiting for at this point in time. Um, yeah, Francesca, do you have any clue? Uh, Francesca's checking. We'll have a live update okay. during the meeting. Excellent. Um, uh, link template field um, is moving quickly through the uh, the IRT, IRT blah, through the process. Uh, if you go to our um, GitHub pages. I have updated the little flow charts that tell you where the thing is in the process. And uh, the link template is moving quickly through the process. I believe there are two open issues uh, related to um, this particular document. Um, I believe it, there is an open issue mark uh, created related to um, uh, internationalization of strings. And so please, if you have thoughts and feelings about interna internationalization, um, there's an open question for Mark, and I believe that's what's holding back. Um, could, Rich, could you look over to Mark and see if you get a nod from him as to whether that is the correct problem? He nodded on cue. Excellent. <laughs> okay. So, um, and for folks who are not familiar with the group, we do a lot of tracking of the open issues uh, on GitHub. So while you might see that the mailing list is fairly quiet, um, there's quite a bit of activity that does go on uh, via the GitHub uh, repos. And you'll also find links to those GitHub repos on our GitHub website, which does introduce a little bit of a circular dependency. We should find a place to link to those more. Uh, is, are there links to the GitHub repos on the data tracker page? Do you happen to? Yes, they are. If you go to the www.datatracker.ietf.org slash wg slash http api, and you click on the about tab, there'll be a, link, a resource link to the GitHub organization, which has repositories for all of our drafts. Yes, there is. Well, not all of our drafts, which is a topic for the next page. Um, so before we move on uh, on from our status updates, uh, a little celebration since last IETF problem details now has a RFC number. So that is now RFC 9457 and becomes the second completed document out of this working group. Yay. Yay. Hooray for us. Thank Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Sanjay. Eric, if you are in the room. OK. That was easy. Next slide. Um, first up uh, is API Catalog with Kevin. Um, would you like to uh, tell us the progress on this document? Yeah, thanks, Daryl. And hi, Rich. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so. Will you be, yeah, you're presenting the slide here. So thank you. This is a quick one, just the one slide. Uh, yeah. Give me a sec. There we go. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. So the first working group draft has been published as double zero. And for those unfamiliar, this simply proposes a well known URI, API dash catalog, uh, which returns a resource representing a catalog of your API. So if the well-known URI is hosted by example.com, for example, you would expect to get a list back of the APIs that example.com published. 
And the aim is to facilitate machine discovery, automated consumption of APIs. It can also be used by human readers as well to see what's available and how to make use of the APIs and what they're for, et cetera. So at, at ITF 117, uh, the, the idea, I think, was, was well uh, accepted. Uh, what the, the, the um, challenge was, was the fact that the initial draft under my name actually proposed a format for the API catalog based on link set. And the uh, the challenge was to say, well, actually, uh, there are companies out there now who do such catalogs in different formats. So we took the decision to make it now up to the implementer that the format of the catalog is up to you. You can roll your own, you can use some of the existing uh, structures in this space, such as link set or APIs.json, HAL, REST desk, et cetera, ones that you can find. So uh, the upcoming changes for the next version are uh, at the moment there's an API catalog link relation, but we've since spotted that in RFC 6573 there's some perfectly usable relations for collections and items, which has the relationship between a catalog and the items within the catalog, which we can reuse. And also I'd hope to take any feedback from this meeting on any other ideas or suggestions that anyone has. And that's my update. Any comments, feedback, any? So a quick question, is it the intent that collection relationship is used as an alternative for API catalog? Uh, yes. Feels like it's lis losing a little bit of semantics there. I, um, I agree, I agree. And it, this is actually a question I had, was that in RFC 6573, it talks about an item being able to be part of one or more collections. Now, in that RFC, it doesn't go on to give a, an extra layer of semantic to say, well, this collection's for this and this collection's for that. So I was wondering if anyone had any experience of, of those discussions and whether that was pointed out at all. Mark? Um, Mark Nottingham. So... I wasn't thrilled about using a well-known location for this, just because, um, you know, intuitively you think, okay, it's at a well-known location, then it, it can be easily discovered, but you still have the problem of what host name to use. Um, and, and, and because there's a mismatch between the boundaries between organizations and, you know, the hosts. There are, most organizations have many, many host names. And even when it's just the top level domain for that, you know, for that company, um, uh, they may not have their APIs there. So you still need to know something. It's not truly really automated. And so then the question is, well, what value does having a well-known URI have over having a just a URL? You know, because uh, if, if I have to be told manually, oh, well, our API catalog is over there on that host, yeah, you're saving a few characters, but I, I don't know that it's terribly compelling. That's not to say I think we shouldn't do this. I, I think you know it's it's harmless to define a well-known location. It's just not very web-like, perhaps. Um, but but what concerns me more is the idea that that we're going to not recommend a format and just have people, you know, do whatever's out there because you know the power of standards and writing this down in an RFC is we're encouraging convergence, we're encouraging interoperability. And so I would hope that, you know, whilst it's good to support different formats so that we can encompass lots of use cases, we would at least recommend one and, and try and steer people towards a default. Um, so I'd really hope that, that we'd see that. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, so to the first point, uh, yeah, I'll get you there. And I think my company's probably in that same position. Um, really, the rationale was knowing a company's top level domain can I query that top level domain to find out where their API catalog is? And it, as you say, it might be on a completely different host, but at least it, it does involve a, a guess as to what the top level domain is of a company, but typically a .com I think is a good, a good starting point. Uh, to the, the second point, um, yes, that, that, that is fair. Uh, there was, a, as I say, pushback in 117 about prescribing a format um, in 
the double zero draft, it does give a, an example of link set, but it doesn't, it doesn't go on to recommend a particular one. So that's something that we can take up on the list to see that out of all the, the candidate formats, whether there is one particularly recommended or not. Any other comments, questions, discussion? Uh, I have a question. Yes, yeah, sorry, please go ahead. So um, for big companies, there may be various groups. They may have various catalogs. So it is possible that there is one catalog for private APIs, which are internal APIs. There may be one for public APIs, uh, consumable by customers and partners. And there may be one for uh, maybe specific partners. Is it possible to have that kind of, uh, 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 you know, different dispatchers from uh, the main catalog? I, hi, Sandra. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't see why not. Um, certainly the the format should be flexible enough to allow that, allow that level of semantic. The, the question about internal and private APIs, it may be that the well-known URI for private APIs needs to not be on the public host, maybe on an intranet host instead, for example. But following that, the concept should be the same. If you hit that well-known URI, on a privately accessible host, then you should get the private APIs for that company. There's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. This is Daryl Mill speaking without chair hat. Um, Mark, I just want to clarify from your comment. Were you suggesting that you don't think there should be a well-known URI or you were thinking that having a link relation of API catalog provides an alternative so that people don't have to use a well-known URI. You can tell me, and I'll, yeah, yeah. Mark again, um, uh, this is a really awkward room layout. Uh, I, if I were doing this myself, I would not have a well-known URI. I don't think it's necessary, but I don't have the energy or focus to stop it. So, but you are supportive the words of. I'm looking for are mostly harmless. <laughs> but the but the word that this you would be supportive of there being a link relation defined in this document specifically to point to something that has the semantics of API catalog, and you are not against. Uh, alternatives, you just would rather there be a default? Uh, or am I, I putting words into your mouth? I understand I live through mouth? UDDI, so I'm very down on catalogs in general, okay? I'm, I, I'm cynical. But uh, uh, sure, yeah, this is a, that would be a natural fit for link relations. I think that's, because uh, uh, then you can have a type attribute that says what the specific format is. If there are multiple possible formats, it, it makes a lot of sense. Then you just need to discover that link relation and you're all good. Um, and and I, then the question is whether um, you know we we're reusing uh, existing link relations or whether we need a new one, and that's where you need to dig down in the details and figure. It sounds like there was a direction on that, but I, I I'm not in. I don't have that state page. Thank you. Okay, I think that. If there's no one else who has comments that would like to make, thank you very much, Kevin, for uh, providing this update. Um, we shall continue conversations on list. And uh, the one other comment that I wanted to make is that I noticed there is not a, um, a GitHub repo for uh, your particular um, document. Uh, so I, I have... I have a couple of questions, one with being to yourself, like, do you think it would be useful to allow people to comment on GitHub issues? Secondly, do you already have a GitHub repo that you are managing this in? And this is more a question to Rich. 
Should we point to external repos or should we ask contributors to bring those repos into the HTTP API org? My, my preference would be to migrate them over. Um, and I think there's a way to do it. I forget the details, right? To, that preserves all the comments and issues and everything that's been closed, right? I think even GitHub has it in their UI now. So uh, yeah, they should all be in, in that one place. That's certainly the intent. Um, strongly, given that in the past, and it's from when this group started, we had a lot of contributions from GitHub because there weren't a lot of IETF people or it wasn't a high percentage of IETF people. And so we decided to explicitly to use GitHub as a main or primary. Um, so yeah, I would like to like to do that. If uh, you need help setting it up, Kevin, we can talk about it offline. Great, thank you. Does that mean yes, you'd like help setting it up offline? Yes. <laughs> we'll, okay. Got yes, please. excellent, thank you. And, thank you. and a, call, a call out to other authors uh, of documents, um, that slide from Kevin with was just a one slider. Just had a few notes. It was absolutely wonderful and perfect, and saves me having to scramble together the night before to figure out what are the things that we're going to talk about uh, in documents. So uh, next time, it would be great if um, you all could provide uh, a single slide like that with updates on documents. Cool. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to uh, another of our newcomers in the group, Byte Range Patch. Uh, Austin, is is Austin in the room? Yes. Come awesome. Mike. Did it just in time. Yeah. Um, I did not prepare a slide deck. It would have, uh, um, I would have had to do that on the flight here. But it, it would be very short. Um, the, Byte range patch is a media type for um, being able to write to a particular byte offset on a document, um, which is a normal file system operation. It just doesn't exist in HTTP for some reason. If you want to download like a particular range of a document, like you know, I've already have the first gigabyte and I want to download the second, um, you can already use range requests. But there's no inverse if I'm like uploading a live feed and I want to resume my live feed off of the first gigabyte that I've already uploaded. Oops, like it, how do I recover from an error like that? So um, the, the one major uh, question that, that I'm aware of right now is how to represent indefinitely long writes on in this document um, because byte range patch reuses HTTP fields and some of the semantics of um, multi-part um, the multi-part media types. Um, the, the problem with the content range field is that it does not support indefinitely long fields. Uh, while HTTP supports like uh, range responses where the server does not know the length of the document at response time, uh, it has to know where that byte offset is going to end uh, due to the syntax of the content range field. So um, right now it had been, uh, right, right now the draft says special cases of format of the content range field that just omits that end number, which is required. Um, this is dubious and possibly fragments the HTTP ecosystem. Um, so I uh, recently posted to HTTP biz suggesting maybe we should either redo the syntax of that field or just introduce a new field. Um, so that is the one remaining question, I think. Um, we, we have a couple of people in the queue. Do you want to take questions? Yes, uh, questions, please. Mike. So HTTP does have a draft currently adopted on resumable uploads. Yes. So let's maybe not say that doesn't exist because it does exist. Um, but there, if there are cases where this overlaps, then we should figure out how to reconcile the two. Yeah. Um, actually, this sort of spawned out as uh, an effort to 
implement resumable uploads for other purposes that I was doing. Um, and I sort of saw this as a first step. This, um, this doesn't intend to replace any of the functionality that the resumable uploads draft is doing, but resumable uploads could definitely use this in order to say, for instance, um, I, I know I've already uploaded the first gigabyte, so here is the offset at one gigabyte that I'm resuming. Um, now there's a number of other ways that resumable uploads could do this as well. They could just use the content range header verbatim in the headers mm -hmm. instead of as a field within the patch. Um, uh, there's various options there, but um, yes. The, Marius Kleidel from Transloaded. Um, I want to bring up exactly that point that you already raised on the list about content range. I think redefining it or changing its syntax is quite problematic. Um, you're doing it in a special situation where you say, okay, content range is actually not in the header, but like in the body of the request, which is less pro problematic, but I think in the end, it's still gonna cause a lot of confusion. So if we can use something like content offset as you um, proposed on the list. I think that's definitely a better alternative than redefining content range. Um, and that's also something um, where we probably can work together with resumable uploads to find a pretty good commonplace um, yeah, to just avoid having different solutions for a very similar problem. Yeah, fully agreed. Um, Either solution will work. There might even be a third or fourth solution that we haven't thought of yet. But um, whichever one works better, I think, is going to be up to each DB biz. Um, like either way, I think it should be formalized as part of the HTTP standard. And even if it's not used for anything else, like servers wouldn't be able to automatically start using content offset in um, 206 responses unless this client indicates some special support for it. Like that could be future work. Um, but in any event, it would have to be a standard that works across HTTP, um, even if it's only used in this place f just for now. Yeah. Yeah, Mark Nottingham. Um, Content range is kind of an awful header. Um, you know, it's from the prehistoric times, and and we've we've run across this problem before. We actually have an RFC that says how to do indeterminate length uh, content and content range, if I remember correctly, and it's a horrible hack, um, which we knew was a horrible hack, but it was our only option because we had to be backwards compatible with the deployed web. You don't have to be backwards compatible in yeah. that sense. So I, I I don't see any great advantages from reusing the header just because it looks kind of like what you want. You know, if you were reusing parsers or there was existing parts of the ecosystem you had to interoperate with, sure, but you don't. And, and the existing parsers are mostly in browsers and, and they're so deep in that you're not gonna be reusing them. So I, I'd say, yeah, define a new header, make it a structured field if it's, if it's gonna be a header. Just as an integer. Whatever, yeah, and, and whatever, you know, figure out what you need from that and then just define it. It doesn't have to be part of the HP standard. Anybody can define a header. Don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> and, uh, 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 you know, it should be fine. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and if you can make it reusable for other use cases, that's great. But you don't have to bend over backwards to do so. You can make it specific to your use case if you want. OK, yeah, that, that's uh, yeah, very good advice. Um, I do foresee many use cases in the future where this header would be reusable, particularly in synchronization and other uses um, actually in, um, you know, maybe this is used in 206 responses if the client indicates it needs it. Um, I'll make an argument that um, doing subscription updates could really benefit from this, but that's another discussion. Um, so any other questions? You? Nobody in the queue. OK. Thank you, Austin. Thank you. Yep. So Mark, um, it's your turn again. You're going to get your steps in today. I'm, 
I'm staying in a much nicer hotel, so yes, I will. Um, yeah, uh, so we adopted link hints. Uh, this is a specification, as you might recall, to define a set of uh, uh, pre-composed uh, target attributes, we say, in, in the language of the web linking specification uh, to put onto links. So you have a link relation, if you recall, and you have a link target and you have a link context, but you also have these target attributes. And so target, you, you know, when you see a link in HTML, it might have like a type attribute on it. That's a target attribute. It tells you what the type of the thing on the other end is. And, and what this specification is trying to do is to come up with a galaxy of, uh, or well, a small solar system of, of those target attributes that are specific to HTTP links that make sense. Like talking about what the resource on the other end of the uh, uh, link is able to do in terms of uh, what it accepts, what it produces, what methods are available, the type of the different representations available, that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and there are hints because, of course, uh, they're not definitive. It's not a contract. It's just uh, a hint as to what might happen if you actually interact with that resource using HTTP. Um, and, and so uh, the use cases for this are a little fuzzy. Um, uh, the obvious ones are probably like a, a, a API description formats and things like that. But uh, I, I put a spec out there a long time ago and kind of let it sit for a while. And enough people kept on, on saying, hey, that might be useful that we decided to adopt it, uh, I think in the last meeting? Yes. Yes. So I haven't really had a chance to, to work on the spec at all. It is in the repo now, I believe we have a repo. I believe it is, yep. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think uh, I'll probably take a look at it uh, in the next, well, before the next meeting cycle. Uh, make any updates that I feel are necessary. If people can take a look at it, we can open some issues and then maybe ship it. Has anybody had a chance to look at this? Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, what was the reason for using the word format to list media types, content type? It seems an unusual. You're choice. literally asking me about a decision I made about six years ago. So. Okay. Well, that, there's an, I will go and add an issue. And so you okay, can think do. about it while you're reviewing. I don't think any of it's, you know, cha changes aren't problematic. So we should, you know, feel free to change stuff. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So um, I, I'm going to take this opportunity to make another little soapbox side, side speech in that um, Mark has a talent for getting things to move fairly quickly through the process because he's written a whole lot of docs before. Uh, we have a lot of um, first time authors uh, in this group. And uh, if there's one thing that I've learned in the last few years is that if documents are not reviewed in detail before working group last call, they will be reviewed in detail in all of the following steps that happen afterwards. And it's kind of frustrating for authors who say, hey, I've made it to working group last call. Now we just have to go through this next step. And then they start getting piles and piles of, of um, comments when they go through uh, area, di area directorate reviews and stuff. So it, is, it would be very, very valuable to our current authors and we have quite a number of docs in process if we can get some experienced eyes on those documents to provide feedback on that content uh, before it it goes to the next stages where they're going to get them thrown back at them and it's harder to manage those changes as it moves further upstream i shall get back down off my soapbox francesca Sorry, I'm sitting too far from, from the mic. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, chairs and ADs and the working groups can request directorate and area review teams reviews um, uh, anytime during the process, if that helps. Okay. So um, if you think that there are documents that will benefit from a first uh, 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 read through, let's say, then it's it, you can you know, talk to the chairs or to the AD and then we can organize that. Awesome, thank you. 
and I'm here to, to advertise that we now have an HTTP review directorate. So that specifically can, we can have people take a look at that. And, and I can assign, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm leading that directorate, so I assign reviews to different people, including Daryl. So you can cause him more work. No, because then I'll just give it to me. <laughs> okay. Moving on to our uh, REST API media types. Now, I believe uh, Roberto was not able to join us today. Is that correct? Because I think he was yeah, he, out he's, sick. Yes, exactly. He's sick. OK. So I did I did a quick review of the open issues that are there. And uh, again, if you go to the GitHub organization and you click on projects, there is a project that summarizes all of the open issues across all of the documents. And that is up to date um, as of late last night. Um, the, the open API, the REST API media types attempts to define two new media type or register two new media types. It attempts to register the open API media type and the JSON schema media type. For the open API media type, there are two blocking issues, really. One of them is that the open API specification people need to go write to security considerations. And I won't say who's on the hook for that. <laughs> Uh, and the other item is uh, with regards to fragment identifiers for what are referred to as plain name fragments. Um, and it appears I also have been the blocking person on that. So uh, I, I think both of those issues can be resolved uh, fairly soon. Um, I am much less confident about resolving the JSON schema issues because I don't understand them well enough. Um, and so one of the questions that I think we need to answer is, um, is should we split this into two specifications is, is one question so that we can deliver the open API registration once and then secondly, the JSON schema as a separate thing. Um, and then the other question, which is, um, oh, awesome. Thank you, Austin. Actually, let's answer that question. F let's see what Austin has to say about that. And then I have one other question primarily for Mark. Um, hello, Austin Wright. Um, like, um, yeah, all of the above documents, I think, have their uses sometimes, but in this case, like there's only two registrations in here in JSON schema right now. Um, some of our close collaborators, we've been trying to figure out like ve uh, venues for publishing and how to publish and how to break it up, um, interoperability requirements and that sort of thing. And um, uh, I, like this document lacks many of the interoperability requirements where we would not be able to publish revisions and have that be backwards compatible with validators written against the version that's uh, been published first. So um, yes, let's break it up and um, yes. OK. Thank you for that input. Um, the other open question relates to uh, the work that, Mark, you're running in the media man, which is this idea of um, allowing community formats to be registered in the standards tree. Um, I think I'm correct in saying that both of these documents, both Open API and JSON Schema, are kind of fall under the target of what your intent is for the community standards. And so my question to you is, is there value in continuing down producing these RFCs as well as, uh, how do you see the relationship between the doc you're working on and us built working on these RFCs? Sure, um, so Mark here again. Uh, yeah, uh, that is absolutely the intent is to make it easier for 
what are perceived as legitimate communities uh, working on open formats to register without jumping through the hoops of, of publishing RFCs. Uh, that we're going to talk about that document uh, this afternoon or this evening here. Um, my gut feeling is is that there hasn't been a lot of feedback. Everyone seems pretty happy with it, so I think we're probably going to last call it pretty soon. However, uh, I think the current plan for publication there is that it will be incorporated into a larger update of the uh, uh, master document, as it were, and that's going to take more time. Uh, so uh, I'm a little unclear about whether or not um, a community registration could be done until we actually publish that RFC. Uh, we, we speculated a little bit about it in the last meeting in San Francisco, if I remember correctly, but we'd need to um, figure that out. Uh, I suspect it might be possible to do so. So, uh, but, but that doesn't stop publishing these RFCs. You could certainly publish these RFCs and register, and that's a very legitimate way to go about doing it. Um, or or if, if, if for whatever reason people you know lose uh, the focus to do this, we could try and use that process, but, but it might be a little dicey until, until the RFC is published. Okay, so if we have low hanging fruit, like if we split off the open API and we can get that resolved quickly, then continue with the RFC. And if there are bigger issues around JSON schema, maybe we hold off and wait for them. And by the time we've resolved those issues, uh, the community registration may be the right approach. Sure, that, that sounds reasonable, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to our auth link relations. Um, I guess two questions. Is Everett in the room? Because I don't see Everett on the list of attendees. I can, he, don't think so. I'm going to back up one sec. So are, is the intent, is it decision to split the document into two and, and move ahead as circumstances allow? Is that I, the conclusion? I, I think that there is support for that in the room. Uh, we should talk to Roberto. Okay. Let's, yep. So uh, with regards to Authlink relations, um, for the record, uh, there's two items there. One is, A, it doesn't have a GitHub repo, and maybe that's why we're not getting a whole lot of feedback on it. Uh, and secondly, it has just, just as today, has expired. So uh, we should ask Everett to submit an update. Uh, does anybody else have any other comments or feedbacks if they have read or reviewed the Authlink relations? Yeah, I don't think there's been any action since we asked them to submit. Okay. Yeah, I created the repo and told them to put it here, and there's been no action. So. Yes, oh, that's right. There is a GitHub repo. It just doesn't have anything in it, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that brings us to item potency key. Um, I know Sanjay woke up very early to join us today. Uh would you like to speak to uh, the current state of item potency key? Hey, <clears throat> good morning, folks. It's probably good afternoon. Uh, I, there are two issues there. Uh, Daryl, I think the sec second one that you have mentioned, uh, I'm not sure where that is. The minor editorial issues, uh, I'll do the next draft. I forgot uh, 422. I don't know. I thought I had done that, made the change. And the second one is about removing that uh, last sentence. That's That shouldn't be a problem. You're right, you know, the previous one already uh, gives that uh, meaning. But I'm not sure about the second point listed there. Uh, okay. Uh, where is it actually? Right. So 
if you recall from previous conversations, the proposal from David Benjamin about the ability to use um, the item potency key, uh, the client could send it, even if it doesn't is not aware of whether or not the server supports it. Uh, I did propose wording that we reviewed a few times and you merged that into the editor's draft. Yeah. So at the moment, the only thing is we um, uh, that isn't actually in an uh, official draft. So um, if you could do the editorial content, uh, the, uh, those two editorial issues, and then push a new version of it, then I think we have a document that uh, we should um, look for doing working group last call on. Sounds good. We'll do that. Excellent. David, have you looked at the PR that Daryl did, see if it met what you were suggesting? If not, could you? David Benjamin, I yeah. vaguely remember skimming it a while ago, but it was a long time ago, so I don't really remember. But yeah. I assume it's reasonable. All right. Well, I'm happy to take another look at it, though. Yeah, that, that, that'd be good. I, I can paste the link in the chat to uh, the particular words there that are, uh, are under discussion. Okay, uh, and I see I failed to manage to fit this slide completely on this document. Um, so you'll you'll have to I'll have to tell you what the other two items are on this particular the rate limiting headers. Um, again, this is this is a document that um, I have absolved myself of chair role for this, and I'm working with Roberto uh, to complete the rate limiting headers specification. Uh, in IETF 17, we proposed a introduction of a policy identifier that would um, correlate the rate limiting policy header with the rate limit uh, remaining um, or the, the consumption state header. And uh, that there was some additional feedback in ITF 17 to change both headers to start working as SF items uh, so that you could actually uh, report on the consumption state of multiple policies because you'd be able to have multiple uh, rate limit header describing the state of different policies. That PR has been updated, is in the, the GitHub repo and is ready to uh, be reviewed and merged. Uh, the open issues are two, and they don't quite fit on the screen. One is we had a discussion around we sh people wanted to also have a scope parameter and the ability to be explicit about quota units. Um, and now that we're using SF item, we have the ability to add a set of parameters so we can have an arbitrary set of parameters that you attach to either the definition of the policy or the uh, current consumption state of the policy. Um, those, uh, if folks have opinions about whether or not we should formalize quota units and scopes, um, there are open issues on the repo uh, discussing those things. Uh, I have not yet added any wording into the current PR to address those. The one question that I wanted to bring to the room is that um, uh, in a more recent draft, there was added a registry. Uh, now, it was done while we were still using a dictionary, so it was a register for keys in the rate limit header. Um, but so now that we're using SF item and parameters, it would become a parameter registry. So an, an IANA registry for known keywords, or sorry, known parameters that you could attach to either a policy or the current state. And I'm curious if anybody has any opinions as whether that is an appropriate use of um, a registry for extending these rate limit headers.
Mark, yep, I got it. So, Daryl, can you give us an idea of what's in the registry right now? Uh, on the uh, defining the policy, there is a limit and a window, which is just the letter L and the letter W as parameters. And on the uh, rate limit header that defines the remaining consumption, there is a remaining letter R and reset when reset time, which is a T. So that is a number of uh, seconds remaining. Um, so at the moment, the limit is a numeric value, but it is there's no thing uh, in the message that tells you what it is a number of. You don't know, is it a number of requests? Is it a number sure. of bytes? That's where the, the quota units comes in. Mm -hmm. um, the original definition was, uh, or the, the earlier versions of the spec just allowed the policy to allow the user to add an arbitrary set of custom parameters uh, to extend the policies. Um, but now we're using parameters for both. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure allowing an arbitrary set of extensions is a good idea in case we fall into the problem details problem again. Yeah. Um, I mean, just noise in the hallway, sorry. Uh, generally, you want to use a registry when you need relatively uncoordinated extension. So you, you, you need some degree of agreement about, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to use this extension point and somebody else might want to reuse the value. So I put it in the registry and we make sure we don't have conflicts. Um, but in this case, I think, you know, you're talking about really the core semantics of, of the rate limit header when you're talking about those, those parameters. And so the other model you could use here is just to say that, you know, un, uh, uh, recipients need to ignore unrecognized un, uh, parameters, which is part of structured fields anyway. And if you wanted to find a new parameter uh, that's interoperable, you, you need to revise the specification. You need to do an update RFC. Uh, and so you bring it back to the working group, you know, probably, and, and go through the process um, so that, that it's much more tight coordination about the extension points. Um, the place that, that I would think a registry would be more valuable would be in those units themselves, like the units in the scope work that you're talking about. You know, if we're going to define and say, okay, um, we, we define units of seconds and, um, I don't know, uh, kilobytes received or, or whatever, um, we, you could see the need to extend that in the future in, in perhaps a, a relatively uncoordinated way. Um, likewise, with the scope work, I, I could see us saying, okay, this is per resource or this is per server or whatever, or, you know, per, per, you know, your authentication token is, is your scope and that authentication token has this rate limit. Um, but you probably would need to extend that in the future. And so a registry might be an interesting thing to do there, but the actual core, uh, uh semantics that to me feels more like you want to create more friction against uncoordinated, uh, extensions there, not, not infinite friction, but, but more friction. Thank you. Marius? Marius Kladl. Um, so I just want to second the idea of adding some measurement to communicate the units or the scope. So like, as mentioned quite often, you know, it's helpful to know how many requests you have left, but it's also good to know how many like resources you're still allowed to create um, per time units. So I think I don't have an opinion on how or whether a registry would be um, suited here, but a measurement for communicating units um, or type of unit would definitely be great. Excellent. Thank you for that feedback. If there is no other thoughts or feelings about rate limit headers, uh, I will take that conversation back to Roberto and to the list. Austin.
Um, I just wanted to ask about how the headers interoperate with caching. It, it, it's probably not going to be something that most APIs are worried about, but um, for like object storage, for instance, it might become an issue. Um, it would be unfortunate if a client like sees a cached version of this header and it thinks, oops, I can't download any more documents when in fact it can re-download that from its own cache as much as it likes. Um, so I maybe add some treatment to this or just a warning. Yeah, uh, that's a, an excellent call out. Um, I know uh, in the early days, uh, there is a section uh, on caching in the doc that Roberto um, created. Um, it basically says that um, you should ignore rate limit headers that uh, are included in responses that come from a cache yeah. based on the age. Daryl, it's Mark again. Um, we can double check that. There's some language in HTTP you can leverage for that. Yep, excellent. Cool. Okay, Rich, next slide. Is he recording what Mark said? One sec. Okay, sure. No problem. No worries. We we have lots of time today. We're not going to run out of time. Yeah. Now you just cursed it. <laughs> um. So the next uh, item up is adoption of relative JSON pointer. Uh, I do not believe Henry was able to join us today. Um. And we have had some uh, feedback on list from Karsten with regards to relative JSON pointer, who brought up some very interesting points about the challenges of um, people figuring out how to go up a tree and how to count how many uh, levels up a tree uh, things need to go. Uh, he didn't raise an objection to this being adopted, um, but did add that it would also be really nice to see uh, this kind of ability to go up uh, ancestors in the JSON path uh, specification that is currently being worked on in uh, the JSON path working group. Uh, I don't know whether there's anything else that we can really do here other than ask for opinions uh, in this group as to whether or not we should adopt this document. Um, does anybody have any opinions since reading the doc? Daryl, it's Mark again. Uh, has anybody talked to anyone in the Jason Path group about this, especially the chairs? Well, Karsten is in the Jason Path group. He's a member, right? Yeah. I do, I'm not aware of... of no. Henry talking to them. Okay. At, we will, uh, the chairs will get together. Okay. Thank you. The subtle hint. <laughs> okay. Moving on to the next topic. Um, and I will, I will set a little context and then I'll, I'll allow I'll hand it over to Sanjay to give his opinion on this. Um, we have had a working group document since basically the beginning of this uh, working group in order to standardize the deprecation he header. Uh, there has been lots of discussion about the relative merits of using structured fields in this header versus being compatible with um, the sunset header, which is a peer to the deprecation header, um, we came somewhere close to getting agreement. Uh, and then there was a fork in the road and a conversation was raised about, well, maybe we should just build a more advanced header called lifecycle that encapsulates both sunsetting and deprecation and maybe other parts of an API lifecycle. And so 
time past where there was hope that somebody would step up and go and write a life cycle header to replace the deprecation header. Um, that didn't happen as of a few months ago. And so we decided in order to apply some grease to the process that we would set a deadline of this meeting to say, if somebody wants to go do a life cycle header, go do it. And if you haven't done it by this meeting, then we will go back to doing the deprecation header uh, as appear to the sunset header. And so I think that's a semi-complete summary of the situation. Um, Sanjay is one of the authors of the original deprecation header. Would you like to fill in uh, your perspective? And just to add a bit, thank you, Daniel. Um, so for the lifecycle headers, you know, in my personal experience, um, I haven't yet come across use cases where we have uh, beyond deprecation and sunset uh, any event that uh, regarding the API's lifecycle that needs to be conveyed to the clients. We do have, all of us have our own ideas, you know, this might be useful, this might be useful. So if you think from that perspective, uh, practically, I think um, these two headers, which are well-scoped, uh, sunset and deprecation, um, you know, there is an advantage for, uh, you know, being just a well-scoped uh, uh, header uh, that it, it is just for one event in the APA's life cycle. Um, so in that way, I, I kind of like uh, the application header as a separate header. Uh, but uh, as you were saying, you know, we've been talking about life cycle uh, event header for quite some time. But um, uh, in my opinion, strong use cases have not appeared, at least in my personal experience. So I would, I'm kind of leaning towards keeping the application header as a standalone header, uh, if you know, working group agrees to keep it that way. So speaking without chair hat, I think the one scenario that was discussed um, was being able to signal that uh, a resource is in some kind of preview state so that um, do not take a production dependency on this as it is possible that there might be breaking changes in the future. Um, but that's the only one that I recall as being a status that was floated in addition. Mark? Yeah. Not, not even an artist needed. We took out a lot of exercise today. Mark, Mark Nottingham. Um, I, I feel a little bad um, because, you know, I, I, I pushed for this a little bit. And uh, I, I, I think that, you know, in, in, in a better world, we would be doing it, you know, as, as life cycle. Um, but I feel bad because I, I don't have strong opinions about this, but I know that if you take a date field to IETF last call, there are going to be people who feel more strongly than I do that things should be structured fields now in HTTP. And you're going to get that pushback fairly strongly. Um, so uh, that that's the observation I'd make, um, which, yeah, like I say, I feel bad. Sorry. Uh, I'm willing, I didn't realize there was a deadline. Um, if, if it helps, I'm willing to put some editorial cycles into making a proposal if, if, if there's interest in doing it. But if folks want to stick with deprecation, I'm, I'm fine with that. So for what it's worth, I, I, you know, if, if Daryl, you think that would help. So I think the question about, you know, Mark, the, the date field or uh, the structured field, uh, I think, um, that's that's okay. I mean, if it's a structured field, I think at least that's my personal opinion. But uh, the other question was, you know, should we have a life cycle event header, a completely new header? Yeah, Mark. The the thread that that 
triggered this deadline and and us mm -hmm. needing to make a discussion there was a lot of interest in the deprecation header and in general people were okay with using the structured field for date okay so that's Even the compromise the sunset yeah okay yeah. well then, then maybe that solves that problem and i certainly wouldn't uh have a problem with that um i i kind of feel like if we had the energy to go off and really investigate and, and research and document what the life cycle of an API should be, that we could do some interesting work here. But but I don't know that we're capable of doing that right now. So you know maybe maybe the right thing to do then is to publish deprecation, uh, get it out there, and then learn from that and see if there's something next in five years or something. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. On a related note, I have a question the working group. Is there a way we can uh, find out, uh, let's say, this deprecation header, where uh, it's being used? When I, in the past, I used to do research to find out where, you know, deprecation header or item border key header, key header are being used, which API developers have adopted it. But it's just a personal, you know, thing. Uh, if we have a way to find out that where this is used, then it will help us uh, in taking steps like going from date field to the structured field, and you know, are we breaking things or not? Any, any thoughts on that? How we? Um, I believe the general sentiment in the past is. Uh, we are attempting to be forward-looking and that the concern about breaking existing adoption of non-standardized things is not a significant influence in having us choose the best option to move forward. And so um, while understanding what people do out there is interesting and is informative towards overall design. Uh, we don't have a mandate to build things that are very compatible with existing implementations. And if I said that poorly, apologies, but it was my best effort at capturing the sentiment that we've heard in the past. There is freedom. That's good. Thanks. All right, okay. so we have, uh, as I understand it, um, we'll work to get the value of the header be a date structured field and uh, resubmit a new draft and it's ready for last call. If someone down the line wants to investigate and work on a full life cycle document, welcome with open arms. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Great. Thank you. Excellent. And so uh, that brings us to the end of our scheduled topics. Uh, Francesca. Uh, so I got an update from the RFC editor about the YAML media type document. And they said they had missed the uh, Zahed approval. So that's why it was stuck in ASG, waiting for ASG. So now it's unstuck, it's in edit again, and they put it on the top of the queue and prioritized to get through Auth48. So great, we're getting that oh. moving. <laughs> so the other lesson learned is guilt is a good motivator for the RFC. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for following up on that, Francesca. Thank you. Awesome. One more win on the board. Excellent. OK, so does anybody have any other uh, topics that they would like to bring for today? Or shall we just end early? OK, I think no one wants to come to the mic. I think we are done.
thank you all for your attendance. We made a lot of progress actually on four or five documents. We'll soon be showing up for final review, maybe three or four, whatever. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week and uh, see you, some of you online, some of you in person in Brisbane and on the list. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Sanjay, for getting up really early. Yes, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. You too. You too, Daryl. I spoke totally in front of a live mic in the last one. Luckily, they, luckily they edited out the transcript. Yeah. 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 Oh, sure. No. Yeah.